Okay. Okay, so we're now finishing up assignment nine. We need to roll into project three. We will kick that off on Friday. So look for materials prior to Friday. Hopefully I'll finish that this evening. I just can't. There are two things that I'm having a hard time stomaching right now. One is giving you the same project three I gave the previous couple of semesters. And the other thing I can't stomach is modifying it. So I'm kind of at an impasse. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I'll, uh, so I'll, I'll work up and I'll just bite the bullet and I'll make it newer, better and all that this evening and uh, post those materials and maybe an announcement to remind you to print them out and read them and bring them on Friday. So we have that to look forward to. And for those wondering about Thursday's lab, I had didn't have anything to turn in on today's lab, but uh, had some tasks to do related to the standard template library uh, that will be utilized in the last couple of projects. So, uh, and I think an assignment. So that you'll definitely want to come to Thursday's lab if you want to. Uh, have a better understanding of how some of that stuff works. Uh, I'll probably be posting another assignment as well. I do not know whether I'll post it prior to Friday or not, but I'll try and get another assignment posted sooner rather than later to give you more time to look over it. Today I wanted to, I just thought I'd pick kind of a, there are lots of little topics that slip through the cracks and so I wanted to back up and, and talk about one of them uh, with regard to characters and how the language manages them. And prior to me going into that, does anyone want to ask me any questions about anything? Okay. Right. Yes. I, I was, when we were doing the night project and we had to have Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me stop you for just a moment. So I also uh, have on the table, I had promised to do kind of a walkthrough of Joust. And I wanted to do it in the same spirit of that walkthrough I did in creating a sheet of hex paper. Uh, so you can see how I envision someone coding it up. So I want to be able to refer back to, for instance, a sequence diagram as I do that. Uh, so I have that on deck as well, and I want to have that done before Friday. So I just wanted to let you know I hadn't dropped the ball on that. So my apologies. Go ahead. So when I was doing research on using different things to get string input from people, uh, I was reading online that there was a fairly significant difference in the way that C++ and C handle a get line function and a CN function in terms of for use of strings, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if you could like touch on that a little bit. Uh, so the question is, <coughs> excuse me, if I can touch a little bit on the difference between the way C and C++ are handling string input. Yeah, you're, it, it's really a, a much easier proposition in uh, C++ than it is in C. <clears throat> and to, I guess in order to, to um, talk about why that is, let me, let me talk a little bit about memory, and specifically dynamic memory. So the, the key idea, uh, or I want to say the key advantage to dynamic memory is you are allowed to wait until the program is running to create the memory, right? And the reason that is advantageous for you with string input is because you do not know how large the string is that the user is going to type in. And the way it, it, it works, that it's worked in the C language, so I need to adjust this standardio.h is you decide again there's no string type that is a class so that only exists in C++ and, and I'm, what I'm basically going to get down to is how wonderful the string class is and all the headaches it saves you from. It, when you're learning the C language 
Uh, if you want to do string input, you do something like this. Well, there's, there's no person who's going to type in a name greater than 100 characters. And then you can do uh, scanf, I want to read in a string, and I want to read it into name. Okay. And I suppose I can print it out like that. So let me compile it and run it just to make sure. All right, what do I got going here? Well, C language, none of this namespace stuff. All right, so that's only going to get uh, up to the space. So what I need is I need to do um, man standard O. I'm looking for a different function. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna finesse the the fact that it's only reading up to a space at, at the moment because uh, it's gonna distract me into another discussion. So let let's say for the argument, I'm just looking for a first name and spaces aren't an issue. Uh, so I run this thing. Todd is a long name, and it prints out, and life is good. So the issue comes that this is a reasonable number for reasonable people, but I have no guarantee that a reasonable person is going to be using my program. So... For those who have toddlers, understand what this read says. Or cats. Okay, and what's happened is I've typed it in and I've got an error that's occurred. Okay, and what's happened is I think we understand that what I've done is I've allocated a hundred bytes essentially here and when I enter far more than a hundred this thing just blindly and happily stomps over that hundred and continues on and eventually is going to hit memory somewhere else belonging to something else and uh, the program's going to crash. So this actually uh, touches on a type of uh, error that you get in programs that, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, it's something that hackers, I'm, for whatever reason, my vocabulary has uh, fallen away, but it, it, it's something that hackers have historically taken advantage of, and code's a lot better now. People understand that they are naughty toddlers or cats out there, and that they have to um, code against such things happening. Uh, but just to say it, it's a buffer overrun, and, and what happens is someone who knows how a program runs, what they're able to do is they're able to fill up this hundred spaces, and then they know they've somehow mapped out memory, and they know that the code execution is eventually going to jump to this address right here. And so what they'll do is they'll fill a meg and a half of garbage till they reach this point and then they'll be submitting binary bytes from that point on that jumps to their own code, right? And you have to have an intimate understanding of how coding at the assembly level works to be able to map this out and so forth. But this is some, how people have actually, clever hackers have taken advantage of it. They overrun the buffer, the buffer is 100 bytes, they overrun that and they get their own code at a certain location in there where the program is naturally jumping to that location but then it's now executing their code and their code is doing who knows what. All right? uh, so it's a, it's a big deal. And the question is, well how can I possibly protect myself against that? And first of all you use dynamic memory so what I will do is I will Uh, this is, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I'm now mixing C and C++. Uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to do it in C. So the malloc means memory allocation. It's much more generic in the C language. You don't specify a type of memory. You just say how many bytes you want. If you wanted, uh, just incidentally, how primitive is this? If you wanted an array of 100 integers, you'd have to say 100 times the size of an integer. Right? You have to do all that math yourself, whereas it's done automatically for you in C++. Anyway, um, so what you need to do then is you need to do something like this. Get ch gets a single character, and you put this in a loop. So you have. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna just pseudocode this, not use actual code to give you the idea. While ch is not the end of input. <clears throat> and what you do is you have a variable int count. You have an integer for max. I set the max to 100 because I've allocated 100 bytes. I'm currently at byte 0. And what I do is I say something like name sub count is equal to whatever they typed in for ch. And then I'm going to add 1 to count, count plus plus. And then I'm going to say if count is equal to the maximum, then what I have to do pictorially, and this is uh, much easier to see if I draw a picture, so let me do that real quick. Applications, sketch, pick, okay. Oops, what did that say? Oh, I forgot the magic word there. All right. This will be strings. So I allocate, let me come up here. I allocate 100 bytes. I'm allowed to loop, and I can read up until I hit 100, right? Once I hit 100, I filled up with input. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah, just a real question. How do you make it like finish your command for you? Yeah, that's a general feature of the, the shell, the command completion. So what I can do is, um, let me create uh, one wonderful, wonder-ish. So I have these files here. I can say, oh, and then I, what I'm doing is I'm hitting tab. So I hit tab, and it'll go as far as it can before it becomes ambiguous. So it doesn't know whether I'm finishing with one or whether I'm doing wonderful or wondericious. And if I hit tab a second time, or if I hit tab two times after that, it'll tell me why it's unable to move further. So either I know or if I don't know, I hit tab twice. I get this list here, and I go, aha, I need an underscore. And I hit tab again, and now it goes up to the dir. Now it's ambiguous again. So I can hit tab twice, and it'll tell me it's hung up on these two, so I can say I and hit tab and it finishes it off. So it's tab completion. Okay, so what I've done, I'm not going to do this as, as individual bytes. I'm just going to say I allocated 100 bytes right here. And now I'm starting to fill this up with my text. Once I hit 100, meaning that in my code here, I've reached the maximum. Once the count reaches the maximum, then what I need to do is I need to make it bigger, right? And here's the huge limitation, is that the way memory models work in computers is you can't just arbitrarily grow this, because remember, I have on my computer, I have 200 processes running at any one time. Uh, in addition to my own, own code running. So in this loop, I'm creating variables and maybe functions are being called elsewhere. Anyway, it, what I, the point I'm trying to make is between me doing this initial allocation and me doing this check and realizing I may need to, that I need to allocate more memory, there may be already other variables that have been allocated here. And so it, it, I'm unable to simply grow that memory. Okay, so the strategy that's used if once I reach the count getting to the maximum, 
is I have to grow this. So now rather than 100, what I want to do is I want to expand it by another 100 so that I have 200 spaces. And then if I reach 200, then I grow it to be 300, right? And the way that's done is on my next iteration here, I'm going to grow this to be 200. Excuse me, I'm not going to grow it. I'm going to allocate a brand new chunk of memory that is 200 bytes. And then I'm going to take these 100 here and I'm going to copy them into the first 100 spaces here. Now my count is 100 and my max is 200. And after I've, I've created the 200 here and I've copied, then I come back and I release this memory using that uh, in C++ it would be using delete. Okay. And now I'm rocking and rolling with the 200. Once I reach that, then somewhere I have to allocate 300. I copy the 200 over, then I release this, and that's how you are able to accommodate the input no matter how large the person types it in, and they're unable to make your program crash that way unless they exhaust memory, and that's a different discussion that I'm going to not talk about right now. Um, so that versus get line? So, so this is, if in the C language, this is how you have to do it. Okay, You actually have to write the code to do this, this for lack of a better term, dynamic growing. The straight, the, there's nothing different in C++. You have the exact same memory. It's the same computer, so you have the exact same limitations on memory in C++ as well. However, this problem is a very, very common problem. So the inventors of the C++ language decided to, in their standard library, they would provide a string class that will grow dynamically for you. All of that, if you were to look at the source code, of uh, the member functions for the string class, you would find this code that I just started to outline right here. It would be looping, and uh, or at least you'd have this check. If you're trying to add another character, it would go ahead and do this, allocate another chunk of memory, copy, and release. Okay, so you don't get away from it in C++. But fortunately, the creators of the string class have done all this for us. So now we have this beautiful thing that we can do in C++. Uh, C++ strings. And I can do string s, and I can do something like get line. Thank you. I didn't remember the order. Now this thing will. So note that I didn't give it a size here, right? So there is some generic size, just like I allocated 100 characters for my character pointer in C. There was some number, maybe it's just 10 characters. I don't know what the number is. It was allocated for S. And as soon as we go over it, it's going to grow it. Um, but when I run it, it'll grow as long as it needs to grow. Okay, And, and it isn't going to crash on us. And so... I didn't do a C out to print it out, but it took the input and it didn't crash. So that, I don't know, did I answer? I don't, not even sure I remember the question entirely, but did that answer it? Pretty much. So essentially, like, essentially it's just like get line instead of dynamically allocating. Yeah, so get line, what, yes, so get line is, uh, it's basically taking the input and it's feeding it to S like one character at a time, and it's giving S an opportunity to have that check and see if the new character it's getting has made it hit its max, then let's grow it dynamically. So that's what's happening. But, I mean, it's great because it, this is, this is uh, to use ter object-oriented terms, they have encapsulated this behavior in the class, and all of that detail is abstracted away. All we have to do is input a string. All we have to do is ask the knight to wield. And we don't need, as users of the knight class or as users as a string class, we don't need to know the details of the wield function, and we don't need to know the details of what it's doing here. So that's the power of object-oriented programming. All right. Talking about characters for a little bit. <coughs> Uh, all characters have a numeric representation, and historically they have been uh, every, uh, 
character has a numeric code associated with it. And historically, that has been referred to ASCII, which is the American Standard Code for, I'm going off memory here, Information Interchange, something like that. Uh, this would have been developed you know, like back in the six, late 60s, early 70s, somewhere back there. Uh, the world has gotten a lot bigger, and every country in the world uh, obviously has computers, and they want to represent their own languages, and ASCII is not sufficient to do that. The main reason is that ASCII assumes one byte. How many possible values are there in one byte, which is 8 bits? 256 values, okay, and you uh, you need more than 256 spaces to represent every glyph on the planet that's used for language. So now it, it, you're going to find that it's going to be something like UTF-8, and this is a standard that will grow somewhere from one byte to four bytes in size, and will handle every language on the planet. Uh, but setting aside that. Uh, but whether or not you're dealing with today's version or yesterday's version, the codes are identical for the uh, English, the, the glyphs that we're using in the English language here. And you can type ASCII chart or something like that. I did that a little bit earlier. Here it's showing them. Uh, you can ignore the second column, which is giving us the values in hexadecimal. What I'm interested in are these this should say decimal values. These are the decimal ASCII values. So some interesting, let's go to the most interesting one. Well, that's a stretch. None of them are interesting really, but uh, one that, that you, you end up, after you do this for years and years, you memorize a lot of them. So uppercase A is 65. Note that lowercase A is its own glyph. So it's 97. Uh, and so, and you have a you have a code for all the symbols here as well, and you can look at that. So I can assign A to CH, and then I can say C out CH. Now this is going to print out the letter A, but what I can do is well, let me see if this is going to grouse at me. Um, oops. All right. What you can do, is, this is called casting. I did a little bit of it in the tutorial, uh, but all I'm doing here is I'm forcing the compiler to look at this as a number rather than taking that number and giving me the, the glyph representation of it. So if I do that and I look at it, uh, there it is. 65 is the code for uppercase A. Okay. Yeah, you can even write a little loop. You can write do, uh, how about while, let me see, I want to do CN, CH, and then what I'll do is I'll say I want to see out the character and a little equal sign, and then the number version of that character. Let me put a little space here around that. And we'll say while ch does not equal an uppercase x. Uh, I don't have a semicolon on line 12. There we go. Okay, so I compile it, and now it is... I've forgotten my chevrons. All right. Okay, so now you're seeing all of the ASCII codes, the numeric codes for each of these letters. Uh, you'll note that, of course, I'm not getting quite what I want. So let me use um, cn.getch. I'm not getting spaces, so let me try that again. All right, here we go. Uh, so space is 32, and I hit return, right? So it's interpreting that character as well, and that's the new line. The new line has got a code of 10. Okay. Um, interesting thing. What's the difference between A and A and B and B? 
A, the uppercase letter 65, 66, so they're all contiguous, and the lowercase letters are contiguous, 97, 98. Why those numbers? So really, why is A97? Is it 25 more? Let me do a little bit of math here. So if I say 65 plus 26 letters later is 91, why is lowercase a 97 and not 91? Does this make sense why I'm asking this question? You would think if you're going to lay out this chart, why don't you have the uppercase letters here, you hit Z 26 letters later, and then why don't you just start lowercase a here and go lowercase a through Z? Why did they stick these funky codes in between? Let's have a look at binary. So, uh, this is this is two to the zero. This is two to the one. This is two squared, right? And this is just base two. So it's ten to the zero, ten to the one, ten squared. That'd be the hundreds place, tens place, ones place. Same idea. We're just looking at bits and bytes. This is to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, to the sixth, and what are these equal to? One, uh, one two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. Hut, hut. There you go. A little. I was a high school football star. I'm sure you believe me when I say that in high school. Um, so, what is sixty-five? It's 64, dump, 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 65, yes, 64 plus 1 is 65. How did they do 66? This, this would become the 1, right? So, what is uppercase A? If this is 65, let's go to 65. Our 97 minus 65 is 32. 32 is actually one of these slots here. So the difference between all the uppercase letters and all the lowercase letters is they switch this to a 1 for the lowercase letters. And this actually is, is brilliant because the math is complex to flip a bunch of bits to get from uppercase A to lowercase A, but the creators of ASCII realize that the conversion between lower and uppercase is so common, we want to make it as efficient, as efficient as possible. And they've made it so that if you want to go from uppercase to lowercase, all you have to do is flip one bit and you switch case. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions about how I led the team to victory in my senior year in high school in football? <laughs> For the football thing? Yeah. I did, and that's that's why I was the water boy and not on the field. <laughs> All right. uh, any, other, any other questions? All right. So, again, look, keep your eyes out on the announcements and so forth. I will get out, hopefully, an assignment, get out the project materials and so forth, and we will... Oh, yeah, secret word, secret word. So I, I got, with the secret word, I got a little bit uh, tired of vocabulary. So I decided to switch to arcade games that I knew and loved from my high school years. <laughs> so the first one is, this was a great game. You don't know how, how good we had it. Uh, I'm off one CD. Qbert. <laughs> All right. Anyone? Anyone remember or know of Qbert? All right. You're going to want to Google these, right? And nowadays, you can get emulators for them. So you you think you're having fun with the <laughs> massively multiplayer online RPGs? You're going to want to do Qbert. Huh? Yes, you, with the, so it's not case sensitive, but you do need a Q, an asterisk, a B-E-R-T. You should have told me the cast thing after class, because that guy is hilarious. It's almost like a...